Wow, it's great to, to see so many people from around the world. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, and I think, I think we are uh, ready to get started. Uh, so, hi everyone. Siobhan here from Sudan Ancient and Modern. And I would like to welcome you to our talk tonight. Before beginning, I would like to thank the Egyptian Exploration Society, and particularly Dr. Carl Graves for hosting our event tonight. I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker and my very good friend, Renan Limos. Renan is currently completing his PhD at the University of Cambridge and will be speaking on transformations of objects in New Kingdom Nubia, local consumption and demand in a colonial context. Renan, you have the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne and Letty, for inviting me again to speak in the Sudan Asian and Modern series seminar series and thanks the yes for making it happen and everyone who, who joined in this evening so let's start uh, there's been recent discussion on the place and role of egyptology more specifically and northeast North East africa in general within broader theoretical debates and interdisciplinary approaches it's probably a good time for us to start readdressing traditional questions within our field with the aim of deconstructing deep rooted frameworks and attitudes that don't find echoes in today's social agendas and to propose new questions that will allow us to overcome traditional barriers to knowledge production and fully include Northeast Africa and the Nile Valley into debates in archaeology and other social sciences. One of these debates revolves around discussions on colonialism, past and present. Colonialism isn't a phenomenon situated in time. Its effects, are, its effects are experienced continuously throughout history, especially when ancient and modern versions of colonialism meet in modern discourses about the past. Even if some scholars have discussed the ancient Egyptian colonization of Nubia in the Middle and New Kingdoms, effects of which were felt in the past and in the present through its reenactment, for instance, in the writings of scholars like Reisner, most approaches have been based on homogenizing colonial epistemological backgrounds, such as Egyptianization. Moreover, as Adams and Edwards have long ago pointed out, the Nubian past in general and Nubian experiences of colonization in the New Kingdom more specifically, have traditionally been approached based on exogenous data sets, mostly comprising ancient Egyptian textual and iconographical sources referring to Nubian populations. Important publications such as the seminal Ratchet Coach by Stuart Tyson Smith or the more recent work on depictions of foreigners in 18th dynasty Theban tombs by Anthony have shed light on the highly ideological Egyptian representations of Nubians in the New Kingdom, which were, ideolo which were the ideological side of imperialist expansion and colonization. Ancient prejudiced colonial views of Nubians were reinforced and reenacted in the first scholarly interpretations of Nubian past which conveyed inappropriate homogenizing perspectives on Nubians, considered as inferior and primitive as a culture. These views are currently being challenged by scholars and institutions focusing on the decolonization of the Nubian past and field projects in Sudan developing initiatives in cooperation with local communities. And here I would like to highlight Elizabeth Minor's work and the ancient Nubian Al exhibition in the MFA in Boston. Nevertheless, the role of material culture is still to be fully explored in modern narratives focused not much on ancient Egyptian colonization itself, but rather on past Nubian material experiences of foreign colonization. Material culture allows us to directly access past experiences of colonization in New Kingdom Nubia, but not only. It, al it also allows us access to, to local diversity and social complexity during the Egyptian colonial periods. Immense data sets have been produced after many years of archaeological exploration in Lower and Upper Nubia. These data sets, which are kept today in various museums around the world, have been produced and interpreted within a colonial paradigm or mindset. Firstly, scholarly, a scholarship emphasized indigenous inferiority in comparison to Egyptian social forms and material culture brought into Nubia with colonization. These earlier attitudes towards Nubian data sets and history paved the way for later approaches that emphasized the acculturation or Egyptianization of Nubian traditions and practices 
with the introduction of the Egyptian colonial presence in Nubia, as if Nubia had always been an empty book ready to be filled with history by foreign colonizers. On the contrary, in this presentation, I will use the material culture from various New Kingdom cemeteries across Nubia as evidence for Nubia's internal diversity and complexity, which were disregarded and homogenized by both ancient Egyptian discourses and Egyptocentric approaches to Nubian past realities. The Egyptian colonial presence in New Kingdom Nubia was materialized through a widespread set of Egyptian style objects found at various sites. These were considered as expression of the complete Egyptianization of Nubia. On the contrary, in this presentation, I will focus on the transformation of foreign objects to fit local realities within New Kingdom Nubia as evidence for Nubian diversity in a context of ancient and modern colonial attempts to homogenize local contexts. Recent excavations in Sudan and approaches to cultural interactions have shed light on the agency and presence of Nubian populations in contexts dominated by Egyptian material in Nubia. Recent PhD thesis such as Letty Kilroy's at Oxford and Lynn Saviglar's at Chicago have reassessed the role of ceramic assemblages as part of more complex contexts in New Kingdom Nubia. My own PhD thesis at Cambridge aims to reassess the social role of foreign objectscapes in local cemeteries in New Kingdom Nubia, which included Egyptian style scarabs and other types of seals, various types of jewelry, shabtis, heart scarabs, and many other categories of foreign objects introduced to Nubia by Egyptian colonization. As my thesis demonstrates, these objects are spread throughout Nubia, but far from, far from expressing the standardization of traditions and practices, these objects were only discontinuously adopted in local contexts according to local realities and social structures, including local preferences for things and the local ability or limitation to consume foreign objects expressed in different material manifestations of the same phenomenon, as you see on the screen. The New Kingdom in Nubia is characterized by a new project of expansion, occupation, and colonization in Nubia led by the ancient Egyptians. This project differed from the first attempts to establish dominion in the south during the Middle Kingdom. In this period, the Egyptians built a series of fortresses in Lower Nubia between the first cataract and Simna. After a gap between the Middle Kingdom and the New Kingdom, the Egyptians turned their focus once more towards Nubia. The earlier fortresses seemed to have been occupied without interruption. Evidence from Buhan indicates an alignment between local independent ruling groups and the ruler of Kerma. With the advent of Egyptian colonial rule in the New Kingdom, it isn't clear what happened with the communities of expatriates living in the fortresses during the self-sufficient period of Lower Nubian fortresses. But these fortresses, such as Aniba and Buhen, were reorganized and expanded during the, mid the New Kingdom. In this process, temples were erected and magazines and residential areas developed, as well as large cemeteries. At the beginning of the New Kingdom, the Egyptians had already expanded as far to the south as Sai Island. Discussion remains about which pharaoh founded the island's fortified settlement, either the first pharaoh of the Egyptian New Kingdom, Ahmose, or his successor, Mehotep I. Later pharaohs sent military expeditions to Upper Nubia, and the southernmost boundary at Kurgus had been already reached under Thutmose I, but was only finally established under Thutmose III. In the second half of the New Kingdom, the character of the Egyptian expansion policies changed from a more aggressive military expansion to a focus on territorial occupation. Before the major architectural interventions in Nubia, Thutmose I had ordered the construction of the so-called Menenu at the ceremonial city of Dokigel, substituting Kerm as the former seat of the ruler of Kush. Later, Hatshepsut and Thutmose III intervened significantly in the architecture of the city. In the same period, Thutmose III enlarged the main temple at Sai. In this period, the Egyptians started to build temple towns across Nubia, which were characterized by a surrounding thick wall, five meters thick in the case of Sesebi, which bounded the settlement space rather than fulfilled any defensive role. Within the enclosure were located a stone temple, magazines, administrative areas, and housing areas. These temples fulfilled a complex role in the administration of Nubia, but were mainly associated with the exploration and processing of resources, the main one of which gold. 
On the heart of the third commission, temples at Soleb and Sidenga, Boy Wakanatan ordered the construction of a temple town at Sesebi. Although activity prior to, these, to his reign has recently been detected at the site by Cambridge excavations. Other temple towns were constructed later on in the New Kingdom. An example is Amara West, which was built in the reign of Seti the first. New Kingdom cemeteries in Nubia developed in association with these urban sites, from large administrative centers such as Aniba, Sai, and Soleb, to settlements with less extensive cemeteries such as Sesebi and Amara West. However, not all cemeteries are associated with surviving settlements, for instance, Fadras, although this might be due to a changing river and occasional floods. These cemeteries housed the tombs of individuals from all social strata. This is clear in the types of tombs and associated objects. Tombs included both Egyptian settler, settlers and Nubians who lived together in various temple towns, as illuminated by, work, by the work of Michel Bouzon based on isotopic analysis. Aniba, Sai, and Soleb were important administrative centers in the New Kingdom. The cemeteries associated with these sites include tombs with elaborate superstructures, most commonly pyramids and substructures comprising vertical shafts leading to various chambers. These tombs usually include a superstructure consisting of a mud brick pyramid or a courtyard and are usually associated with elite individuals closely linked to the colonial administration. Inscriptions found on tombs architectural elements or on grave goods detail the relationships between individuals buried in the cemeteries and the administration of the colony. A variety of titles appear on objects such as shaptis, including administrative, religious, and religious titles such as prophet, priest, goldsmith, mayor, overseer of the treasury, overseer of works, scribe, etc. The title Viceroy of Kush also appears on shaptis, but only two viceroys of Kush are known to have been buried at Aniba, Seti, and Mesui. Most of the viceroys of Kush were buried in Egypt at sites such as Thebes and Tel Basta. On the other hand, the mortuary landscape in New Kingdom Nubia was more diverse than attested by the evidence from powerful colonial centers. For instance, the cemetery of Fadros, which is the largest cemetery excavated in Nubia, includes several types of tombs, totaling almost 700 burials. Burials at Fadros encompass those usually attributed to individuals from non-elite and intermediate groups. The excavators identified eight different types of tombs at Fadros. More recently, Spence regrouped the burials at Fadros into four types, which were pit burials, the most common type of tomb, not very deep, usually dug in the size of a body or a coffin, pit burials with a side niche, pit burials with a mud brick chamber, and pit burials with an end niche or a double end niche. Over 70% of the burials at Fadros contained none or up to four ceramic vessels and a few other objects such as scarabs or little pendants. These are usually pit burials containing an individual body. There are also examples of collective burials, which might have played a specific role in the process of creating distinction as I will just suggest later in this presentation. These tombs are usually more elaborate and contain a greater number of grave goods. Although collective tomb and tomb reuse, collective tombs and tomb reuse were an important phenomenon in New Kingdom Nubia, further research is needed in order to shed more light upon this aspect of colonial society. The objects found in burials in New Kingdom burials in Nubia are mostly Egyptian in style, with the exception of objects coming from elsewhere, such as Mycenaean stirrup jaws found from Lower Nubia to Upper Nubia. The most common type of Egyptian style objects found in New Kingdom graves in Nubia is pottery, especially Egyptian style well made ceramics. Amongst other Egyptian style objects are coffins and funerary masks, shabtis, heart scarabs, amulets, pendants, and jewelry items, weaponry tools, scarab seals, toiletry items, and other personal objects. Burial containers comprising wooden coffins, sarcophagi, mat coffins, and pottery coffins are amongst the most widespread objects at New Kingdom cemeteries, appearing in all types of burials. They are made of local types of wood and can be rectangular or anthropoid, the later being more common. In Sudan, wood is usually poorly preserved, and in most cases, only fragments or traces of 
the presence of coffins are found. Exceptions are the coffins found at the tomb of Jehutihotep in the Beira. These coffins are usually plastered and brightly painted. The decoration includes typical Egyptian New Kingdom motives, depicting various deities and protective signs with regional variations, as studied by John Taylor. Types seem to match contemporary styles in Egypt. For instance, Aniba tomb S91, Sai tomb 26, and Fadrus tomb 511 included coffins painted black with yellow decoration, typical of the late 18th dynasty. Soleb tomb 5 produced two stone sarcophagi, as you're seeing on the screen, which are exceptions in the New Kingdom Nubian objectscape. Pottery coffins have also been found at Aniba and Soleb. Matte coffins made of wooden sticks tied up, to, tied up with vegetal ropes have also been found at Soleb, and they are usually associated with non-elite contexts in Egypt, such as found in Saqqara and Amarna. Funerary mosques are also found in several sites from Lower to Upper Nubia, including Aniba, Buhen, sites in the Debeir region, and Sai. When preserved, they are usually plastered and brightly painted in a similar way to coffins. Shabtis were found at several sites across Nubia. They come from shaft tombs, double end niches, pyramid shaft tombs, end niches, and one pit burial. These objects tend to concentrate at important administrative centers such as Aniba, Sai, and Soleb, having been found in larger reused tombs. However, Shabtis also provide evidence for the circulation of objects internally within Nubia. As mentioned, the Viceroy of Kush Mesui, who was active in office during the reign of Merenta, was probably buried at Aniba, but one Shabti, in the same style of the Fayan Shabtis I showed you before, uh, inscribed with his name, was, made, uh, was found at Wadi Asabu in a pit burial, maybe a local copy for, made for someone else. Uh, in, uh, locally. These objects can be made of hard stones, wood, faience, and clay. The hard stones of which Shabtis were made are not usually found in Sudan, which suggests that these objects were imported. In fact, after a stylistic comparison, Amino Gu was able to retrace a group of black serpentine Shabtis from Ani, Basai, and Toshka back to its original workshop somewhere in Egypt. Exact examples from Egypt are now kept in Liverpool and Edinburgh. Yulia Budka has recently excavated an example, a further example belonging to the same uh, group at site tomb 26. Stone and wooden shabtis tend to date from the 18th dynasty and seem to be mostly imported. Fayan's shabtis tend to date from the 19th and 20th dynasties and seem to have been mostly produced locally as I would like to suggest. The same is true for clay shabtis. Hard scarabs from New Kingdom, Nubia, come predominantly from pyramid and shaft tombs and at elite sites. Hard scarabs also appear in other types of tombs, although more rarely, such as end and double end niches. Mud brick chamber tombs and simpler shaft tombs also uh, include hard scarabs sometimes. This would indicate that non-elite groups also had limited access to these highly restricted objects. My typology of hot scarabs, as you see on the screen, also include pectorals and heart amulets, which come from the same context and seem to have performed a similar role in local contexts. Jewelry is common in all cemeteries and is widespread across different types of burials including earrings, bracelets, rings, and pendants. Beads are usually found scattered, uh, but strings have also been preserved, which allows us to reconstruct necklaces and bracelets. Materials include faience and hard stones, such as carnelian. Jewelry, especially earrings and bracelets, could, be also, could also be made of other materials, such as ivory, which was a strong symbol of Nubian identity. Oh, yeah, I missed the order of the slide. Uh, ivory is among the materials brought by Nubians to Egypt in tribute scenes, such as the one at the tomb of Hui, as you see on the screen, the TT40, or the tomb of Vizier Rekmire. The large white penanula earrings worn by Hekanefer at TT40, or the ivory bracelets worn by Nubian individuals in the same scene, have many material parallels from many cemeteries across Nubia, 
prior to and during the New Kingdom. Penanula earrings also seem to have originated in Nubia in the Kerma period, then becoming more common in Egypt during the early New Kingdom. Pendants include a variety of motives from flowers to representations of hands, of gods and goddesses, sorry. These objects are usually found around the neck or chest or near the hands. This pattern is usually is also true for scarab seals, as you see on the screen, which at sites such as Soleb could be mounted as rings, a typical uh, pattern of the 18th dynasty. Both jewelry and scarab seals may have been used in daily life contexts as adornments, charms in the case of jewelry, or in administrative activities, and then recycled at cemetery sites. Scarab seals include a variety of decorative patterns, including names of kings, deities, and private individuals, administrative and religious titles, representations of gods, animals, protective signs, and abstract patterns. These objects, together with pottery, are very good examples of the far-reaching character of colonization through objects in New Kingdom Nubia. Weapons were also found in New Kingdom burials in Nubia. However, they do not represent a large part of overall burial assemblages, which is also the case with settlement contexts. For instance, at Fadrus, only six axes, two daggers, one short sword, and 23 arrowheads were found. It has been suggested that weaponry in burials would represent status, especially axes, although the presence in cemeteries such as Fadrus would uh, make us question such an assumption. Smith has pointed to the fact that stone axes were a common funerary offering in various periods of Nubian history. For instance, a bronze axe was found associated with leather and textile fragments next to the, next to the neck of an infant in tomb 108 at Fadrus, this decorated uh, axe that you see on the screen. This is an example of how weapons could be offerings from the living to the deceased, especially in this case, as the axe would not be expected to have belonged to an infant. Tools and other utensils also comprise a small portion of burial assemblages. While they appear at sites such as Aniba, Sai, and Soleb, they do not seem to have played a major role because people at these sites possessed the more restricted objects such as shabtis and hot scarabs, widely unavailable in non-elite contexts. The technical quality of such objects also changes depending on social contexts. For instance, simple versus elaborate rivets at Padros and Sai, respectively. Tools and utensils are more frequently found in settlement contexts such as Oskut and Sai. Unlike weapons, which could be either an attempt to mark status or local identities, tools seem to have been an object category with broader meanings and more accessible to a wider range of individuals. They seem to be more prominent at Fadros than at other cemeteries, which suggests that non-elite groups would have access to objects used in daily tasks while being unable to consume more restricted objects such as shabtis. Objects in this category include all fish hooks, grindstones, etc. Mirrors, jars and applicators, cold jars and applicators, razors, tweezers, hairpins, cosmetic boxes, and other toiletry cosmetic items are also found at several sites. The most common object type in this category are coal jars, which appear in several types of tombs. Coal jars are found in different shapes and materials, the most common of which are alabaster, but other materials include faience and hard stones. Although highly standardized in terms of style, coal jars could also work as basis for identity negotiations. For instance, coal jars on a base appear only sporadically at Egyptian sites, but have also been found at pen grave sites in Nubia. A further example comes from site Debera 33, which you will see on the screen, a pit burial containing an ivory version of an Egyptian style coal jar, uh, strongly influenced by Kerma styles, uh, as you see in the comparison between the, the towerette represent the tower rats represented in, on the jar and found and in, and in inlays found at Kerma. Even though objects such as coffins and other items made specifically for the burial are common in New Kingdom Nubia, 
Other objects such as canopic jaws are extremely rare, either because they were not valued in Nubia or because they were socially restricted, although local creations have been excavated. For instance, only two Egyptian style canopic jars were found at Sai. A set of three canopic jars was also found in the tomb of Amenemhat, Prince of Tepet, Gebera. And a set of four canopic jars come from Aniba tomb, S66. A further, set with, a further set of four small globular jars stopped with clay lumps possibly shaped as heads was found in recent excavations at tomb 26 at Sai led by Yulia Budka. Additionally, from the same tomb, uh, ceramic jars were also found, but it seems that a small clay head was later attached to them. Uh, these might indicate local attempts to recreate canopic jars according to local demands and expectations. These objects will be investigated in a forthcoming publication by Julia Budka's team. No traces of mummification have been detected in New Kingdom Nubia, a situation that can be compared to non-elite sites in Egypt where individuals had access to objects such as canopic jars, but not to mummification itself. However, Michel Bouzon has suggested that some indications of mummification were present at tombos, where canopic jars have also been found. These are mainly linen fragments and textile imprints on mud. Although the wrapping of the body, which would stabilize body members for its deposition in the grave, was part of the ritual at some sites, it does not mean that the intention to preserve the body for the afterlife was present in New Kingdom Nubia. Another aspect of the ritual that is usually associated with mummification is the use of a black resinous material studied by Kate Felcher, which was poured onto mummies and coffins. Steindorf noted that the shrouds involving two bodies found inside an intact chamber at a Niba tomb, S91, were embedded in this black substance or black goo, as Kate Poacher uh, says. Uh, a 20th dynasty coughing fragment from Moro West has also been found with a layer of black resin. However, the preservation of the body for the afterlife was the main reason for mummification and no evidence for such a belief has been found in Nubia so far, nor actual mummified human remains as far as I know. When Reisner led the first part of the archaeological survey of Nubia. He was unable to identify complexity and diversity based on the Egyptian style material culture he excavated in a cemetery at Shelab, very, a, a set of material culture very similar to the types of objects I just described. According to him, and I quote, the scarabs, amulets, and shabtis are identical in form, material, and technique with similar objects being found in Egypt and the New Empire. Following Reisner, Georg Steindorf interpreted the material culture from Cemetery SSA at Aniba in an equally homogenizing fashion. Uh, for example, he believed that, and I quote, all shabtis found at Aniba were probably made in Egypt and exported to Nubia. Many shabtis were mass produced as the owner's names were usually left uninscribed, especially within the text of the Book of the Dead. These objects were not made for a specific person and were sent to Nubia to be sold. It is true that many shabtis from Aniba do not bear the owner's name, but this is especially the case with early 18th dynasty stone shabtis, clearly imported from Egypt as the example in the cover of my presentation. <clears throat> However, this does not mean that imported Egyptian objects were adopted and handled in the same way throughout Nubia. On the contrary, imported shabtis, as well as other object categories, were adapted to fit local expectations, a process which could result in completely transformed objects. This process of adapting and, re and recreating patterns included later decorative additions carried out onto imported shabtis to make them follow local demands for foreign objects and alternative roles performed by typically Egyptian objects in local Nubian contexts. For example, as these shabtis which were imported and locally adapted uh, in order to fit uh, the local owner's uh, ideal of these objects. Besides, the vast majority of shabtis from Aniba are made of faience and clay, 
which could be produced locally, as I argue in my thesis. And those usually bear inscriptions naming their owners and sometimes inscriptions almost certainly added by local hands. Foreign objects reached Nubian communities belonging in certain social ranks, distinguished by certain material features and cultural backgrounds, and located in different areas of Nubia. These communities faced the same material phenomenon, colonization, in a variety of ways, in the light of their ability to consume foreign objects or not, or to reproduce them in local ways. This process, in this process, local demands for the foreign, perceived and experienced distinctively, also played a role in the constitution of colonial society and may have resulted in the transformation of foreign objects. In other words, foreign objects might have become other things locally. Thus, initially imported objects could have been transformed by local communities to varying degrees, following different local demands for foreign objects. This in turn may have changed local relationships, but they may also have been changed by local consumption practices. For example, as mentioned, local alterations on 18th dynasty stone shabtis were not limited to adding names onto preconceived shapes. Local individuals could also change the decorative scheme of such objects according to the material availability of or access to resources and skilled personnel in order to make foreign objects fit local expectations. Moreover, foreign objects may have had their materiality completely altered, usually but not only by means of local reproduction. This may have resulted in different versions of foreign objects that basically performed local tasks and which would probably have had a limited appeal to individuals in New Kingdom Egypt. If the material transformation of objects was possible, resulting in what has been understood as material entanglements, it depended on social, local social structures and relationships, which would allow individuals and communities to consume these objects and negotiate their positions through their materiality. Though entangle, I believe entanglement isn't a concept that allows us to describe the, the, the whole complexity of what was going on in New in the New Kingdom, but this is a discussion for another time. Uh, the local transformation of things which allowed local individuals to either adapt colonial impositions to their own demands and local realities depended on power relations and hierarchies, as objects such as shabtis were only available to specific groups placed in higher social spaces, while non-elites mostly recycled daily life objects at their disposal, such as pottery, seals, tools, and weapons. For instance, Fayan's shabtis could be decorated following Egyptian style patterns, but sometimes an especial decoration was also added to these objects, including unparalleled types of baskets on the back of some Fayan's shabtis from Maniba, also discussed by Anna Wushmid from Leipzig. But the most striking example of local transformation of foreign objects is a group of clay shabtis from Maniba tomb S32. The unique Shabtis from tomb S32 at Aniba can be dated to the 19th dynasty. A recent reassessment by Hambodoye and Sile of the occupation phases of, at the tomb would reinforce such a dating. These Shabtis are the first to bear a headband in the whole Nile Valley, therefore consisting of an innovation that resulted from the local consumption of foreign objects by groups able to consume restricted objects in colonial Nubia. The white headband seems to be an expression of Nubian identity displayed through foreign objects. The famous model of Nubian soldiers from the tomb of Mesehit at Asyut depicts Nubian individuals wearing a white headband in the same way as in the Shabtis from Aniba. Additionally, four stealers from Gebelein assumed to depict the Nubian individuals living in the region during the first intermediate period also display their owners wearing a headband. In Egypt, Shabtis wearing a headband will only appear in the late 20th dynasty, becoming widespread from the 21st dynasty. Being the earliest examples of Shabtis wearing a headband, the clay Shabtis from Aniba tomb S32 consist of a complete stylistic innovation and probably resulted from demands of Nubian individuals living in colonial Nubia for foreign Shabtis adapted to their expectations and practices. A further example of transformation of foreign objects in local contexts comes from Soleb. 
A commemorative scarab of Amenhotep III was found in tomb four. The disturbed tomb, which was in use from the late 18th dynasty up to at least the reign of Ramesses II, is a large pyramid tomb with a courtyard and three subterranean chambers. Archaeological context and grave goods found inside the tomb suggest that people buried, the people buried in tomb four had access to more restricted objects such as Shabtis canopic jars and heart scarabs. Commemorative scarabs appeared in the late 18th dynasty and were used almost exclusively during this period. Most of them were manufactured under Amenhotep III to celebrate the achievements of this king. Late, the, these, large, these large scarabs can be probably considered the greatest examples of global objects as they were specifically manufactured to be sent to all parts of the Egyptian empire where their use would be dictated by local rules. The large scarab from Soleb tomb four measures 8.3 centimeters by 5.6 centimeters and belongs to the class of lion hunt scarabs issued in Amenhotep III's year two. The scarab is made of blue green faience and had a longitudinal bronze tube attached to the head of the beetle as you see on the screen. Typically commemorative scarabs feature a longitudinal hole, but they do not include any pendant like feature such as a bronze tube. I would therefore argue for the repurposing of this large scarab as a heart scarab locally, presumably for someone unable to read the original hieroglyphic inscription. However, while foreign objects were used in elite sites by individuals able to consume these objects to create and reinforce social hierarchies locally, communities such as the one buried at Fadros did not have access to shabtis and other categories of, of Egyptian style objects which were restricted to elites. Although one heart scarab was found in tomb 511 at Fadros, which housed a group of individuals deposited together alongside a much higher quantity of objects than found in the majority of single non-elite graves at the site. However, would such an object have performed the same role as it would in elite cemeteries in New Kingdom Nubia? Uh, Fadros tomb 511 consists of a collective tomb containing several individuals, as I told you. The bodies were deposited in two separate chambers, although people's desire to be buried together can be seen in the existence of a single niche on top of the wall separating both chambers, where offerings would be made for all. Only bone fragments were found in the, in, in the south chamber along pottery vessels, while in the north chamber, the bottom layer contained the burial of two adults, associated with fragments of black type wooden coffins and an infant burial. The upper layer contained the three other child burials and a subsequent adult burial, whose legs were left by the doorway. It seems that the child burials in the upper layer were blocking the way for, subsequent, for the subsequent adult burial. The tomb also received attention from people outside the group buried inside, as can be seen through the child burial deposited later outside the main mud brick structure of the tomb. The Fadra's heart scarab, which is unique among, among almost 700 burials, was found on the face of one of the earlier adult burials in tomb 511. It may have moved from the chest in the process of deposition of subsequent burials or during the plundering of the tomb. The limitations of colonial society in terms of having access to objects and la the later deposition of burials and the presence of satellite bearers around the tomb suggests that people from both inside and outside the social group to which the individuals inside the tomb belonged found it ideologically attractive and efficient to be buried with an individual who possessed a hot scarab, by far the most distinctive object in the whole cemetery. Borio suggested that satellite burials surrounding the pharaoh's burial also benefited from the resources uh, provided by the king in the Middle Kingdom. Similarly, the materiality of burials such as tomb 511 was attractive to people who could not have access to a hard scarab. In a context of material limitations to the acquisition of burial goods, specific groups might have collaborated in death in order to have access to restricted objects, 
which rate to effectivity might have also been shared by non-elite individuals, therefore reinforcing their placement at the bottom of local hierarchical scales of power. These examples discussed work as evidence not just for cultural contacts that result in entanglement, the mixed result of encounters between Nubian and Egyptian cultures. Nubia was never a cohesive cultural entity. Instead, the New Kingdom wave of material colonization represented by Egyptian style objects at sites throughout Nubia met a variety of social groups with varying cultural backgrounds and placed in different hierarchical ranks, which characterized a diverse and complex society. This would result not just in contacts between two cultures, rather, various Nubias in the plural interacted differently with Egyptian style objects according to varying local social structures that would limit or enable communities to consume foreign objects and preferences for certain categories instead of others. Foreign objects were transformed in Nubian elite and non-elite contexts differently and performed essentially distinctive social roles, characterizing a complex and diverse society previously homogenized by Egyptocentric approaches. While local elites were able to consume shabtis and hard scarabs and based on the materiality, negotiate identities and social positions up to the point of creating global innovation, non-elitic groups were generally unable to access these objects. When possible, their alternative collective uses of objects such as hard scarabs differed considerably and probably reinforced their positions at the bottom of society instead of allowing these groups to negotiate identities and positions through the materiality of foreign objects in local contexts. A reassessment of Egyptian style material culture from Nubian sites has the potential of unveiling previously unknown social logics that characterized Nubia as a complex and diverse society in Stuart Smith's words, out of the shadow of Egypt. Future theoretically inspired research has the potential to further expand our knowledge of Nubian society in the New Kingdom, despite ancient and modern attempts to create homogenous versions of Nubia. Thank you. Hi, Renan. Thank you so much for your talk. I found it very interesting. Um, and I would just like to remind the audience, if you have any questions, please, please do uh, put them into the Q&A chat function on the bottom of your screen. Um, and I believe the chat will be coming on now as well. So I actually had a question to get us started. Um, I was wondering if, uh, and perhaps this isn't a fair question, I'm not sure what the material culture will tell you, but can you tell whether the people who engaged in the local consumption practices and who experienced material transformations, uh, can you tell whether they were men or women or if there were any gender patterns or other? Um, yeah, that's my question. I haven't, I haven't personally looked at gender and differences in terms of gender, uh, mainly because I am working with old data sets produced in early excavations and for most of the cemeteries you don't have information. Uh, although Fadros is an exception within the, 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 the burial landscape in New Kingdom Nubia, and even though we don't have information about uh, gender apart from a few skeletons, so I couldn't, I couldn't draw any conclusions based on, on gender as a variable. But, okay. I, I, but for, further excavations are happening everywhere in Sudan, and possibly and hopefully we'll be able to, to shed more light onto, onto this. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna check the Q&A really quick. Uh, yes, we have a question from Marie Larmor, uh, and she asks, how much evidence of plundering of graves? And how much could this skew some of your conclusions? This is a very good question. Um, most of the cemeteries uh, I, I looked at are plundered and but 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 i have I have developed tried to develop an approach in my in my thesis which focuses on objects and the the material power of objects and the objects that obviously we we have uh, available to us to discuss uh, but uh, most of the cemeteries have been plundered, and sometimes it's really really difficult to 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 say uh, 
things more categorically based on these data. Uh, I, I probably don't have time to 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 go on methodological uh, issues regarding pondering, but I try to to to, to approach the material culture in a holistic way. Uh, but yeah, it's difficult. It's a major issue. Uh, there is no right or wrong or like a categorical answer to 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 the question. But yeah, you're right. Uh, some of some of my conclusions probably might have to be uh, reassessed by others once they are out there. Great, thank you, Renan. Um, we have another question by Anna Garnett. Uh, she says, "Thanks so much, Renan. Really interesting. You mentioned potential local production of faience shabtis. Have you looked at traces of this production, molds, etc.? Is there evidence of where this might have taken place?" It's, there is very, very limited evidence for faience production in New Kingdom, Nubia. There, there are few glimpses probably from our west, from Sai, but it's difficult to, to pinpoint whether uh, faience production really took place in urban sites. And I'm mostly suggesting this based on the evidence uh, from the objects themselves, like inscriptions that were probably more, almost certainly not imported and low, the, 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 for example, the, the group of Shabtis from Tumbes 32, which were, according to how I see them, which were local expressions of identity and were probably not imported in, in that way uh, and were unknown in Egypt uh, by the time they were produced in Nubia. Uh, so I used mainly the objects uh, themselves and in, in order to, to try to suggest that uh, local production took place, but evidence from settlements are very limited. Great, thanks, Renan. Uh, so Sarah Doherty has another question. Do most graves that you studied contain a mixture of Nubian and Egyptian objects, or are there any just Nubian or just Egyptian? And how do you identify? That was the emphasis. Uh, the in the entanglement approaches. The entanglement approaches emphasized the mixture of Nubian and Egyptian. But you, you're mainly able to see this in elite context where people were able to consume the objects that would materially allow them to uh, create such a negotiation in order to display mixed identities. If you take into consideration the, 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 the most part of the population in all sites, people didn't have other option than to look like an Egyptian. Uh, but how do we interpret this context? Did people simply adopt uh, Egyptian uh, practices and ways of displaying cultural affiliations? Probably not. And that, that's what I tried to, to, to understand in my thesis based on the social role performed by uh, my foreign objects in local contexts that were, were not empty before colonization and probably influenced a great deal uh, the way foreign objects were used in, 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 in these contexts. I can't hear you, Siobhan. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> muted myself accidentally. Um, another question by Stephanie Dunkowitz. Uh, she says, I believe you said that wood coffins in Nubia are rare because wood is not well preserved in the Sudan. Why is this the case? Oh yeah, because of termites and also floods. Okay, um, another question by Gwyn Williams. Did their intention or use of item ever change? Did anyone see them uh, different locationally? Yeah, it, I don't know if I understood that correctly. Uh, do you mean the same objects used and conceived in different ways in different locations within Nubia? If this is the case, yes. Uh, one, the, the same Shapti. For example, the, 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 the types of Shabtis I showed in the beginning belonging to the Viceroy of Kush Mesui. At Aniba, they, they belong to the Viceroy of Kush Mesui, but in a pit burial in another location, probably not. It, the, the object was recycled and reconceived and re experienced in a way. Uh, and I tried to, to, to do the same uh, exercise of identifying alternative roles for the same types of objects and sometimes exact 
uh, uh, versions of the, 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 these objects in different locations uh, according to uh, cultural backgrounds, uh, power relations, access to, to objects or not, and so on. Great. Uh, we have quite a few more questions, actually. Um, so Navin El Malt asks, is there any artistic differences in their objects compared to the Egyptian, Egyptian ones? Uh, he means artistically in the artistic development. Yeah, some, sometimes these objects will be adopted without any, any local modification, uh, any uh, uh, local modification that we can see. Uh, but these objects would be modified accord, locally modified according to Egyptian standards, or they would uh, be completely transformed uh, according to, to local backgrounds, to the point of creating innovation, complete, completely uh, creating innovation within the, the, the broader Northeast African context. Great. Um, Ahmed Nasser would also like to say thanks for a great talk and has a question concerning the use of the term Nubia to describe a culture contemporary to the new, new Egyptian kingdom, New Kingdom Egyptian. Uh, he wants to know what about Kush and is there any evidence of the name Nubia before Christian times in the Nile Valley? Oh, this is a very good question, but I don't really go into this debate, although it's really, really necessary to revisit terminology. Uh, what I did in my thesis was to rethink the use of New Kingdom Nubia. I don't use New Kingdom Nubia at all, I used it in this presentation, but in my thesis I used Late Colonial Nubia. Because these this terminological options that were traditionally made, uh, they're usually Egyptocentric and they do not convey uh, a broader, complex, diverse set of meanings and experiences of, of uh, colonization in the New Kingdom. Uh, it's, it's, it's the same for, for the use of Nubia or culture. Depends on, on the theoretical attitude people will take towards their, their subject, but it probably a, a colloquium or a seminar series should be organized on terminology so we can better discuss this. And I definitely don't have an answer for, for the question, but yeah. That sounds very interesting. Perhaps something we can work on in the future. Yeah. Uh, so Robert Vigar also has a question. He says, hi Renan, great talk. Your provocation that there are many Nubias, that Nubia was not a cohesive whole as is continuously propagated, is a very enticing one. Do you think that there is a movement within Nubiological studies to decenter notions of a contiguous cultural Nubia towards a multiplicity of Nubias? Oh, definitely. And you see this in, in many recent publications and in the questions people were asking before they, they set out excavations in Sudan. And yeah, the, the, there is definitely a movement that is aiming for a more diverse and complex Nubia, not just in the New Kingdom, in, in many different fields. All my examples and my focus will be the New Kingdom because it's what I know better. But people working on many periods of Nubian history are, are doing, are, are following a similar path towards a more diverse version of Nubia, Nubian history, yes. Along similar lines, uh, Fabio Frizo um, would like to say he got very interested in this vision of various Nubias. Besides the differences between hierarchical groups like class or elite versus non-elite, uh, we can talk about an intense homogeneity between, or can we talk about an intense homogeneity between different lower Nubian sites or a homogenous lower Nubian identity? I don't know. I, I, I tend to not to, to follow towards a, an, an homogenizing path in order to, to identify groups. And I, I, I don't know. I would have to, to, to look at, at the data again in order, with, with these in mind. But I, what I did based on the distributions of the same types of objects. Firstly, on the distributions of the same types of objects across various different sites from lower to upper Nubia. Uh, and then in the social role performed by specific types of objects in, in, in specific contexts was to basically emphasize difference and diversity. And that's probably what 
I don't know what we need to do now, but I don't know if we can, we can talk. I really don't know. don't know the answer. I don't know if we can talk about a lower Nubian identity or an upper Nubian identity. And I also tend to not disagree, but to, to, to look with the critical um, attitude to divisions between lower and upper Nubia because those were, are also Egyptocentric divisions of their colony. Uh, so again, th th this should be better discussed in an appropriate uh, context. I, I don't have an answer for these very difficult questions. Yeah, a lot of good questions coming through. Yeah, I think yeah. people have really engaged with your work and, and want to know, <laughs> or at least discuss. Uh, so yeah, there we'll probably take, debate. sorry, what? There, there is lots of debate that we have to, to have and in order to, to see things in a more, more complex way. And it's good that I don't have answers and that all the people don't have answers and just, just raise questions is, raising questions is, is probably what we need now in order to, to think better about these topics. And my presentation, by all means, doesn't uh, present uh, definite final answers for these questions. It's just a way, a possible way uh, forward. Yeah, great. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. So um, Mark Pettit would like to know, how were Nubians perceived in New Kingdom Egypt? Oh yeah, in a very ideological prejudiced way, as you see in, in iconographical sources and textual sources from the Middle Kingdom and New Kingdom, uh, the wretched Kushites uh, and so on. The, 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 but was an ideological, the, these sources which were used in the past in, in, as the main sources to explain how Nubian society, Nubian history took place and worked, uh, they, they were an ideological strategy of the empire in order to, to legitimize their, their, their power. But in Egypt, they, they, I don't think they, they ever wanted to describe how how things were actually going on in, in local context. But yes, they, they characterized the foreigners in general in a very negative way. And it wasn't always just Nubians, correct? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah not just yeah. Nubians, mainly Nubians. Mm. All right, so for the last question, uh, Mahmoud Imam would like to know if there is any evidence uh, that refers to the transformations in the functions or purposes of certain objects, uh, probably the 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 commemorative scarab I, I just presented, uh, which had this bronze tube added to the top, uh, and these objects were too 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 big to be worn as a pendant, which was the the main way people conceived hard scarabs in the Nile Valley, uh, but people just by just by adding this bronze tube, they, they totally transformed the the, the ex their experience of an object which was firstly conceived to uh, as propaganda of the empire, and they transformed it into a personal <laughs> object amulet, maybe, uh, and according to, to the local expectations, it, this would never be the case uh, in an elite context in Egypt, but in an elite context in Nubia was perfectly accepted both to to transform, to subvert the meaning of an imperial object into, into something meaningful locally and socially relevant locally, just by adding a bronze tube on top of it. Great, well, um, thank you so much, Renan. I think we, are, we have answered our last question because it is about time now to, uh, to end this talk. But um, the questions that are left in the Q&A, I will forward on to Renan, or I actually think you can see them perhaps, but either way, we will get back to you. Um, so yeah, look out for more Sudan Ancient and Modern lectures coming your way online uh, over the next couple of months. And thank you to Renan, to the Egyptian Exploration Society, and to everyone who is here today. Hope you all you. are safe and healthy. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks to every, everyone who attended and to Carl and the ES for making it happen and to Letty as well, who I cannot see right now, but she's there. <laughs> In the background. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you.